Welcome to part two of the annotation worksheet solutions. Today we will be doing the one for NCBI and BLAST. The first question was to name two websites that are good sources of background information about genes. This should be pretty easy. It is Uniprot and Flybase. So Uniprot is going to have information on the function of the gene a lot of the times and Flybase while also having that tends to have a good list of synonyms and alternative naming conventions that you can use to recognize your gene when doing research. Next is to explain this available evidence table. So by this I meant more so the, the right side of this table. Under the gene model tab, this denotes the gene as either being partial or complete. If the gene model is complete, that means that it is locatable in Apollo or the genome as it's in its entirety, whereas if it's a partial, it's going to either be a fragment or in multiple fragments or just incomplete in general. This next column with evidence supporting annotation, if there is an X in the box, that means there exists these tracks in Apollo that you can pull up consult as evidence sources to help you in annotation. Explain this copy number table and why are copy numbers important to look at. With this, just to make it a little bigger, the first column is the gene name or symbol that uh, denotes what gene we're looking at. All of these columns have orthologous organisms and at the intersections of the gene name and the organism denotes how many copies of the gene exist in that particular organism. So this is useful if you're doing a validation or annotation and the organism that you're currently working on has the copy numbers available. This lets you know how many genes you expect to find. So with actin, when we were doing that, you expected to find three genes. However, sometimes when you're doing annotations from scratch, the copy number table isn't known. So in that case, it's important to look at the other organisms and this gives you sort of a baseline understanding. So say, for example, we didn't have decitri for timeless. We see that all of these other orthologs have one copy of the gene, so we expect to probably find one copy in decitri. Versus, in this case, HR3, some organisms have zero, others have one, others have two. So we could expect to find anyway from zero to three of these genes in decitri. So what is NCBI and what are some of its important resources that we use often? So NCBI stands for the National Center for Biotechnology Information. So NCBI contains several databases that are available for us to use. Uh, the two important ones that I use most frequently and it will be used most frequently in annotation are the INSDC and PubMed. So the INSDC stands for the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. And think of it as a cluster of different databases, the list of which are included, are listed here. But essentially, it's a collaboration and compilation of different uh, DNA and protein sequences that we can consult. So whenever you're performing a BLAST, where those sequences are coming from is this INSDC database a lot of the times. However, we'll get into RefSeq in a little bit, and a lot of sequences come from the RefSeq as well. But uh, in PubMed, you may have seen, is a database that has a lot of scientific literature. So a lot of times you'll find some scientific papers if you're doing research on PubMed, which is part of NCBI. So two tools that we frequently use on NCBI are BLAST and the Conserve Domain Database, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I included a screenshot to show just how many different databases and resources are actually available on NCBI, even though in annotation we don't typically use all of them. So what is an orthologue? So to put it simply, orthologs are genes from another species that share a common ancestor with whatever gene that we're working on and looking at. So for example, if we're working on a D. citri gene and we're working on, let's say, GAP-DH, GAP-DH present in Halomorpha halles, that GAP-DH gene in Halomorpha halles would be considered an orthologue to the GAP-DH in D. citri because they're the same gene just in different species. And since D. citri and Halomorpha halles are in the same clade, they would be considered as having descended from a common ancestor. So some other terms like paralog and homolog 
there's a YouTube video that I linked here that if you want to watch can get you a little bit more versed in cladastics, which at some point you're probably going to have to make phylogenetic trees, so it may be good to review this. So BLAST, we use BLAST a lot. What is BLAST, why do we BLAST, and what does it tell us? So BLAST stands for the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. It essentially scans the INSDC databases to find other sequences that are similar and statistically significant to our query sequence. Essentially, we put in our query and the database gets scanned and all of the most similar sequences are aligned with ours. And the BLAST is measuring similarity. So it's pulling up the closest in structure orthologs. So oftentimes the reason that this is useful is because typically when you have a higher similarity to orthologous sequences, then that means the gene model you're working on is likely to be more correct as it's closer to the consensus sequence. This is especially important if the gene that you're looking at is highly conserved, and by that I mean a gene doesn't change much over time. And There's a question later talking about uh, conserved genes. So what are the inputs for BLAST? Uh, it's a pretty simple question, but there are three valid inputs. There is the FASTA sequence, the bare protein or nucleotide sequence, which is just the amino acid or nucleotide code respectively, or alternatively, you can just put in the accession number and it would work. So what is a FASTA sequence? The FASTA sequence is essentially a standard bioinformatics format to which you can denote nucleotide or amino acid sequences. Characteristic of it is the caret in front to which you can add comments or things about the sequence and you can actually type in and edit whatever is after the caret and before the coding sequence uh, to add your own notes. So in order to find a FASTA sequence you would consult the NCBI database and you would look for the gene or protein page and it should be present there. So what is an accession number? Uh, an accession number is essentially a standardized code that is in a unique identifier for a peptide or nucleotide sequence. Each sequence is going to have its own unique accession number and you can use it in BLAST. So the accession number will kind of look different depending on what database it's from. It'll actually vary a lot between if it comes from the INSDC or RefSeq. So to talk a little bit about RefSeq, first I want to talk a little bit more about INSDC. So INSDC is this compilation of peptide and nucleotide codes that come from different laboratories or sequencing projects from across the globe. Think of it kind of as like a Wikipedia, but for uh, inputted sequences. So people will upload these sequences. However, sometimes there's going to be repetitions. Maybe several labs all tried to sequence the same organism and they got slightly different results. What RefSeq is, is they take the available sequences from the INSDC and they start off by computer predicting what the consensus sequence is. So they come up with like a non-redundant version of that sequence. For example, if three different labs sequenced halomorphohales for the gap DH gene, you would find three different entries in NCBI. The computer program of RefSeq would examine the three different sequences and based on those come up with a computer predicted consensus sequence. However, RefSeq doesn't only have to be computer predicted. If a RefSeq accession number starts with an N rather than an X, that means that it has been curated. Someone has actually looked at it and confirmed that that is the correct reference sequence. So here I included a little table talking about what the different prefixes are for accession numbers and what they might mean. And in this next question, I outline how the accession numbers would differ. So like I said before, if it starts with an X, and it would be XM for mRNA, XR for 
non-coding RNA and XP for protein. These are produced by some sort of computer program or the NCBI gene annotation pipeline. So these haven't been reviewed yet. However, if it starts with an N, these have been given additional support and potentially curated, which makes them a bit more reliable. So looking at these three accession numbers here, the first one follows a format that differs between the RefSeq ones, so we can tell that the bottom two are RefSeq accession numbers. So the first one comes likely from some INSDC database, which means probably some lab somewhere manually annotated or, or inputted the sequence into the INSDC. So we don't know for certain that it's super reliable, but it was probably, if it was uploaded into NCBI, is reliable, uh, especially if someone sequenced it themselves at a lab. The XP is the RefC created uh, computationally, and the NP is the RefSeq, which has been curated or reviewed, or has additional evidence in some way. So let's say that we're conducting a blast. Under what circumstances would you blast to Insecta versus Hemiptera? So I tend to always blast Insecta, and Hemiptera is sort of the exception. I have to have a good reason to blast Hemiptera. So Insecta is sort of the default for blasting. It is a broader scope since Hemipterans are a type of insect. So in a clade, the insect would be a higher level. It would be more broad spectrum. So if I'm blasting a D. citri, it would pull up various insects. And the reason why I typically blast Insecta is because I like to see model insects pop up. Not every hemipteran has been super well sequenced or studied, but certain insects like Drosophila melanogaster are similar enough to D. citri and are also very, very well known. So by blasting Insecta, you get the opportunity to look at a variety of more understood organisms versus hemiptera it gives you more specific hits that are likely to be closer in structure to the gene that you're working with. But if you blast Hemiptera, you're going to get orthologs that are more phylogenetically related than if you blasted Insecta. However, the scope or the sample size to which you're drawing on for your hits to be taken from are much smaller. So you may get a blast table that has much lower scores or isn't aligning as well just because there's much fewer insects to draw upon. So an example of when I would actually want to use Hemiptera is let's say that a gene is not very well conserved across different insects. So it would be very different in Drosophila versus something like Halomorphohales. So in a case like that, it's not reliable to look at just the Drosophila sequences or other insects because they're not very well representative of what the gene that you're working on in Decitri would look like. So in a case like that where if Hemipterans are all looking similar but other insects aren't, then you might want to just look at Hemipterans in that circumstance. So. Hemiptera blasts I do more conditionally. We touched a little bit on conserved genes earlier, but to go into a bit more depth about that, what does it mean if a gene is highly conserved? So this means that there has been very little variation or change in this gene across orthologs. So an example would be GAP-DH is a very highly conserved gene. It looks exactly the same in Drosophila melanogaster as it does in D. citri and many other organisms, it doesn't change very much. So if you're looking at a graphic summary of a highly conserved gene, you'd get something like this. This is GAP-DH, where you have this one domain and all of the hits are aligning almost perfectly. So this is a very highly conserved gene. So why would we get something like that? Oftentimes, this is because a gene is very essential for function. 
and if some sort of mutation occurred in this gene, it could spell disaster for the organism. Conversely, if a gene has a lot of variation across different organisms, that means that it's likely less important for basic survival. And this allows a little bit of wiggle room for polymorphisms and mutations to occur so that the variation could be acted upon by natural selection. But if it's highly conserved, it's so important that if a mutation did occur, it would just end up being lethal. That's often why highly conserved genes will exist versus those that have a little bit more variation. So in evaluating BLASTs, uh, what is score, percent identity, query coverage, and e-value? So score is just kind of this arbitrary rating that is made by the BLAST algorithm, but essentially just a higher BLAST score means that it's more similar to our subject. And in a vacuum, this number doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of a relative value. It's more useful if you conducted like two BLASTs and you compared them side by side. It's less important in a vacuum, but it becomes useful when you're comparing two different BLAST scores. For example, in this next question, I compare two different BLASTs together. So in this first BLAST, I'm getting BLAST scores that range from 743 down to 715, versus in this next one, I'm getting scores from 284 to 281. So even though the score itself doesn't really mean much. It's just kind of this arbitrary number that means the higher number it is, the more similar the sequences are. So our query is scoring much better in relation to other orthologs in comparison to this second model. So that's why you would use score. Query coverage is how much of our gene lengthwise aligns with other genes. The E value is a measure of statistical significance. The closer the value is to zero, the more significant the match. So pay attention to E value. If the E value is very big, that means that the result or hit is likely not worth considering. And lastly, percent identity is a bit self-explanatory, but it's just the similarity on a sequence level. So to take a little bit closer look at this question, so if we were working on GAP-DH in Apollo, and we had two different versions of the gene model in Apollo that we were looking at, and we only expect to find one copy because we consulted a copy number table of GAP-DH, and we have to pick one. So let's say these are, let's say these are present at different points in the genome, and we wanted to blast both of them to see which one was worth keeping and which one we wanted to discard. So in this first one, like I said before, we're getting pretty good scores. We're getting awesome percent identity. We're getting awesome query coverage. The E values are all to zero. This is a very statistically significant match. However, if we go over here, you can see that the E values are looking much bigger. Or at least they're not zero anyways. Not They're not huge or anything, but the percent identity has not changed too much. The query coverage has not changed, but the score has decreased. So what I did whenever I actually made this for the worksheet was these sequences are the same, but I just cut off like three-fourths of the sequence in this one when I blasted it. And since a lot of the sequence is missing, it's going to rate it as aligning more poorly. So we would end up choosing this version since it's blasting a lot better because it's more similar to other orthologs. So this one we would delete. And also, if we viewed the graphic summary, I don't have it here, but if we viewed the graphic summary, you would likely be seeing that other organisms were extending out much farther than this one. So number 17, what is a domain? So the domain is the individual folding region of a protein. So like in the last worksheet, we talked a bit about protein folding and structure. Proteins will fold up and in their quaternary structure, there can be multiple different domains or subunits. Each domain typically functions independently of the rest of the protein and can accomplish a certain task. 
So this is useful because we can see conserved domains by using the NCBI conserved domain database. So by comparing domains of different proteins, we can actually see if sequences may be missing, especially if the protein is highly conserved. So in this next question, this is really quick, but let's just practice looking at different domains and telling if they're complete or incomplete. This first one, it looks like it's tapering here perfectly. It doesn't have any breaks on the end, so this seems to be a perfectly complete domain. So that one's complete. This one here, if we zoom in a little bit, you can see it has this fork on the end versus this side, which has this nice smooth taper. So this end, we have the left side of the domain missing. Over here, the reverse is happening, where we have the fork on the right side, but the smooth on the left side. There's probably the right side of the domain missing here. And then here, there's forks on both sides. So this means that only the center part of the domain is present, and we're missing bits off each end. And then last here, we can see that it's smooth, and then it forks, and then it forks again, and then it's smooth. And the graphic summary, if you look, the CDD, it's telling us that this is the same domain. This is the accession number of the domain. You can see here, they're both exactly the same. So it's saying these are the same domains. They're not different. But because there's a fork here in between them both, that means that there should be a connecting region that brings this and forms one singular domain. So that's how that works. All right, so here's another application question. Say that we have three orthologs and the domains are like this. Uh, you don't need to see in super depth, but the thing you need to pay attention to is the fact that there's this one domain and then there's a second domain here. And also, we don't see a lot of breaks in the graphic summary. So this is what three orthologs look like. But let's say our gene model, when we blast it, looks like this. So notice how the domain, the second domain, is completely missing. And in our graphic summary, we have a tear here that looks like we have something missing. So when you have a tear like this, what it means is this red line represents one orthologue. So the ortholog sequence would be aligning up till here, but then you have a gap in this black line. That's saying this orthologous sequence has more coding region here, but in order to align up with ours, it has to cut out that and paste it together. So pretend this is two pieces of string. So this is our query. This is our subject. In order to fit and match in the graphic summary with our subject, it aligns here. There's all this extra sequence, but it gets cut out of the graphic summary. So all of this extra is deleted for the sake of fitting with the sequence, and that's why there's this gap here. So that is why it would appear like this in a graphic summary. So what might be occurring? Well, what's probably occurring is that there is some sort of cut that is missing here in our query sequence. So likely, there's some sequence somewhere in the organism that if we found it, we could put it back in the gene model with the hopes of having it being able to align with the full sequence of the orthologs. So in these previous ones, they're connecting fully because they're not being forced to be cut off there. All right. Yeah, so we would have to find the missing sequence, put it back into our gene model, and uh, hopefully fix that error. So the last couple questions, what is a peptide pairwise blast? So this is when you compare two peptide sequences. It allows you to closely juxtapose them and examine the differences between the two structures. 
so give an example of when you'd want to do pairwise blast. So this, you know, is pretty open-ended. But one example off the top of my head is that if we are looking at a gene model in Apollo and we want to compare it to a closely related hemipteran species such as apism, we could do a peptide pairwise alignment and compare how similar they were. And I do this a lot of times towards the end of a validation after I've finished fixing up a gene model in Apollo, and I'll do pairwise blasts with closely related orthologs of the sequence how I found it, and then I'll compare it to my change sequence after I edit it in the genome annotator. And uh, hopefully, after I've made changes, there would be a higher similarity. All right, so the last question is a cDNA pairwise blast. So like we went over in the last worksheets, cDNA pairwise blasts are a lot more specific. And uh, we went over the wobble position and why that occurs. But the cDNA pairwise blast just compares the nucleotide sequence between the two genes. So a specific example of when I would do a cDNA pairwise blast, and this is the main reason I do them, is to make sure that I don't have like an artifact duplication. An artifact duplication is when you have a gene in the genome, in Apollo, and during sequencing an error occurred, so either the entire gene or just a fragment of the gene gets copied and pasted erroneously somewhere else in the genome. Oftentimes when you're blatting and you will come across these artifact duplications. So let's say that we have gap DH and we expect to find one copy in the genome, but we blat into Apollo and we find two copies. And one of them seems to be like a fragment. What we can do is we can pairwise blast them. And if the percent identity is very high, like close to like 98, 99%, and it's very evident that this is just a copy fragment. It's clearly an artifact duplication and we can get rid of it. So that's an example of a situation where you would use a CDNA pairwise blast. Well, thank you for watching this video and I hope that these solutions were helpful to you. Have a good day.